Hi, I'm Father Jim Martin and welcome to Faith in Focus. We're so excited that you're here with us. This show is all about faith, what faith means to you and how you live your faith every day. In this month's episode, we'll talk with Zach Davis, an associate editor at America and one of the hosts of the Jesuitical podcast about imperfect contrition or what to do when we're asked to forgive someone who may not be perfectly sorry. Then we'll introduce you to Sister Elizabeth Johnson, one of my favorite theologians, who will share some of her insights about how we can imagine God. Then we'll talk with Maria Luevano Salazar, a teacher who has just returned from a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. And finally, my friend and colleague Kevin Clark will help us to take a look at St. Joseph and what we can learn from him as a father. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you enjoy this episode of Faith in Focus. Today in our news segment, we're talking with Zach Davis, an associate editor at America Media and one of the hosts of the podcast Jesuitical. Zach has written a great piece about contrition and forgiveness, which has come up often in the news lately. Welcome to Faith and Focus, Zach. Thank you so much for having me. Zach, your article focused on the testimony of Michael Cohen, the president's former attorney. But we've also seen celebrities and, of course, Catholic bishops expressing sorrow and contrition for their actions. Why did you decide to write about this? Well, I noticed that while Michael Cohn's testimony was about the alleged crimes and sins of the president, a lot of the commentary coming out was whether or not we should find Mr. Cohen credible, or should we trust that he's really sorry? The idea was, well, of course he's sorry because he's facing prison time. And I couldn't help but think that we were all asking a religious question more than a political one. Namely, is someone truly sorry if they're only afraid of punishment? And I think this also goes beyond a conservative, liberal, Republican, Democrat binary. As you mentioned, there's no shortage of famous people who don't apologize until their sins are aired publicly. And we all question whether our own apologies or those of people close to us are truly sincere or not. That's right. And you, the question is, is this person apologizing to me because they know what they did was wrong? or just because they want to avoid conflict or trouble. Now, Zach, you consulted the catechism to help this analyze this situation. Can you tell us why you turned to the catechism? Well, the catechism of the Catholic Church distinguishes between two types of contrition. The first, when it arises from a love by which God is loved above all else, is called perfect contrition. So we're sorry primarily because we love God. The second type, imperfect contrition, on the other hand, comes from a fear, quote, of eternal damnation and the other penalties threatening the sinner. This is the contrition that we're all so afraid of. We fear that it isn't valid or because it's at least as selfish as it is remorseful. We worry, I'm only really sorry because I'm afraid of jail on earth and hell in the afterlife. But here's the kicker, sins confessed with both types of contrition are granted absolution. They're forgiven by God through the priest and the sacrament of reconciliation. The Catechism goes on to say that imperfect contrition is also a gift from God, a prompting of the Holy Spirit. So I, I think that we'd all do better in our, in our personal lives and when reading the news to remember that imperfect contrition is, well, imperfect, but it's a starting point for real conversion of heart. I totally agree. Great use of the Catechism. Thanks so much for sharing your insights, Zach. You can find more of Zach's writing on americamagazine.org, and you can listen to him on the podcast Jesuitical available wherever you listen to podcasts. Up next, we'll introduce you to this month's guest, Sister Elizabeth Johnson. Faith and Focus is made possible by generous donors. To give your support or learn more about the show, visit americamag.org slash faithshow. Thank you and God bless you. My name is Mary Kate Holman and I'm a doctoral candidate at Fordham University in the Department of Theology. And I came to Fordham to study with Elizabeth Johnson after having read many of her books in my master's program. Um, I got to take two classes with her before her retirement, Ecological Theology and Christology. The first book that I read by Beth is She Who Is, uh, which is a classic of Catholic feminist theology. It 
articulates the argument that's actually rooted in Thomas Aquinas that we um, should use many names for God, not just one name for God. And so it asserts that using feminine language for God is not only important for justice questions, but is also this undiscovered treasure in the tradition of uh, Christianity. So it, it meant a lot to me as a budding feminist theologian to read that work. I think that I found it compelling not only as a work of theology, but also as a work of spirituality. I realized that the way my own spiritual practice had been shaped around exclusively male language for God had inhibited a more profound, deep relationship with God. Beth is attentive not only to sort of claims about who God is abstractly, but also the ways that people encounter God and the ways that things that we say about God, theological claims we make about God, really do actually impact how we are in relationship with God. In anticipation of her retirement, she invited me to come and have lunch at her home and peruse her bookshelf and take whatever books I wanted. I spent a really beautiful afternoon um, enjoying a meal with her. She shared so many interesting stories about her career. I got to ask her what it was like being the first woman to get a PhD at the Catholic University of America in theology, uh, the first woman to be hired there uh, in that capacity as a professor. And after we shared those stories, I lingered in her library and I took, I can't even remember how many books, um, but definitely it fills two shelves on my, uh, my own bookshelf. When she gave them to me, she said that these are the tools of our trade. Um, and since I'm sort of embarking at, on the beginning of my career, um, that hopefully these tools will be useful to me. So they're not really just artifacts. They also feel like, yeah, like tools. Beth is not someone that climbed the ladder and then is pulling it up behind her. Beth is someone that has built a ladder so that other people, especially um, women and people who care about ecological theology and people who want to um, broaden the, our understanding of God's love for all of creation, um, Beth has really paved the way for us. Today I am very excited to welcome my friend, Sister Elizabeth Johnson, CSJ, to the show. Professor Johnson is a renowned theologian, one of my favorites, and author of numerous books on God, on Jesus, on Mary, and on feminist theology, including books like She Who Is, Quest for the Living God, Consider Jesus, and her new book, Creation and the Cross, The Mercy of God for a Planet in Peril. Let me also say that her work has been of enormous help to me as a Jesuit, a priest, and a writer, and I consider, consider Jesus to be among my very favorite books on that topic, i.e. Jesus. Beth has also been of great help to me personally in my own writing and in my prayer, too. So, welcome to the show, Beth. Thank you, Jim. Let's start with um, She Who Is, which uh, just celebrated its 25th anniversary. Um, the book broke new ground in how uh, people could talk about feminine imagery of God. But I think a lot of Catholics might still be surprised, even 25 years later, with that idea of feminine imagery. What are some simple examples that you use for people to help them kind of understand that topic? Right. Well, the basic source that I use is the Bible. And all through the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures, there are many examples of God acting like a mother to the people of Israel. Um, also, um, Sophia, the female image of God who creates the world and makes it beautiful and so on. Um, in the New Testament, though, there's a particularly interesting example um, in the parables that Jesus told in Luke's Gospel. The parable of the Good Shepherd, which almost everyone knows or has seen artwork. The shepherd leaves 99 and goes after the one that's lost. But immediately following that in Luke's Gospel is another one of the woman searching for her lost coin. And she loses, she has 10 and she's lost one, turns the house upside down, finds it, and like the good shepherd, calls her neighbors to rejoice. And in the end, Jesus says, just so there will be joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and so on. So both of them, in Jesus' own imagination, are images of God who goes out after the one who's lost. And one of them is showing men's work in that day, a shepherd, and the other, the woman in her domestic setting. You know, And some people have speculated without social security, that was her dowry money and it was what she needed to live on in old age. And it was very 
important. And I found Augustine, St. Augustine um, in the fifth century, preached a homily on that in which he began saying, holy divinity has lost her money and it is us. I'd love to hear a homily that starts that way nowadays, because in, in other words, it's female imagery of God, and you don't learn anything more about the care of God for the sinner in the Good Shepherd one than the lost coin one. And yet uh, the tradition of the church has gravitated toward the shepherd. I mean, the numbers of churches, the stained glass windows and so on. Although now there's a few coming in, but someone said to me once, it's because sheep are more cuddly than coins and you can cuddle, you know, you see the image of Christ, the shepherd with the, sh the lost sheep. Well, true, but you know, if you need money, it it's another image. And it's interesting connecting women and money as well. Yeah, you, anyway. in, your, in your book, one of the things I remember uh, is how you said that Oftentimes, the um, the feminine aspect of God is uh, is transferred onto Mary too. And your book went to right. great pains to say, you know, we need to have um, sort of legitimate feminine imagery of God, uh, and we can't just say that Mary, in a sense, is the feminine aspect of God. Um, is that still uh, something you uh, that something you see people struggling with, just even having feminine imagery of God? Do you, do you see that struggle still? Mm -hmm. I, I think the tradition that Catholics have, we're in a more fortunate position actually than most Protestant traditions because we have a feminine figure in Mary mm -hmm. of great power and might, a mother who cares for her children, um, who stands up and tells Jesus they have no wine and gets the wine and you know, that comes in today in terms of the poor, they have no food, they have no water and so on. Um, but there's so much in the tradition about Mary, you know, that grace comes to us through her, that she will intercede uh, with Christ for you if you're a poor sinner and so on. All of that is actually God imagery. And the more patriarchal the Christian tradition became in its view of God and its own structure internally. All of these female images, I, the way I put it, migrated mm -hmm. to Mary and she kept them safe. And so they're there now to migrate back, which is what I think they should do because women have to see themselves as in the image and likeness of God equally as men do. And it's not as easy in the Catholic tradition to do that with all our emphasis on the maleness of God. Has it changed in the last 25 years, would you say? It, it's an interesting question. It, it has changed more in the academic world than it has changed in the parishes in the church. Now, you recently retired after 27 years, is that right, at Fordham University okay. and 10 years at Catholic University of okay. America. Uh, as you look back over your career as a teacher, were there messages that students, um, undergraduates or grad students, seem to continually need to hear? And I'm wondering if there's any stories you could tell about that, or the things that they ask constantly that you found yourself uh, always asking, uh, answering? Well, it would depend very much on what the course was, but mm. deep down, I would say, to hear the message of God's love, apart from uh, gender, race, sexual orientation, um, troubles in family, troubles in personal life, addiction, any of that. That's the fundamental thing. And so, for example, in feminist theology, young women would hear, and the young men in the course, of course, too, uh, that God loves women equally with men. And then when you go into the story of Jesus, the women disciples, Mary Magdalene, uh, how they were faithful in the crunch when the men ran away, um, the witnesses to the whole Paschal mystery. I mean, a whole empowerment comes into young people when they see the story differently. Mm -hmm. um, I remember in a Christ and World Cultures course, a young woman came into my class after one, one particular class and into my office, and she was so amazed that Jesus was a Jew. We had gone through this that day. She took out her cell phone and called her mother in California <laughs> to ex to tell her that, that she had discovered that Jesus was a Jew. I mean, it was the most amazing thing. So all the historical Jesus material, um, and then what we make of it in terms of this is God with us, uh, how then you interpret, you know. Um, just most recently, my last course at Fordham was ecological theology, and one doctoral student came in and sat down, he's a priest, and he said to me, putting creation back in the picture with God in your mind, he said, this changes everything, doesn't it? I said, it does. 
You know, we need a paradigm shift. We need to rewrite our liturgy prayers. We need to redo our catechisms. Um, Augustine said there are three, uh, theologies are three uh, legged stool, God, humanity, and the creation, the natural world. And we have gone without that third leg for a long time. When you bring it back in, everything starts to change. So different students have gotten different insights and run with them in various ways. But I would say at the bottom of it all is this sense of a unimaginably wonderful, gracious God that we can't confine in a concept or a structure or a box of any kind. How about your own prayer? Um, what, when you pray, when you sit down to pray, is it, uh, is it God, is it the Spirit, is it Jesus? Uh, what, what's the most common for you, would you say? It's more apophatic than any of the um, particularities. I think... Can you define apophatic for people that might not... It's like without images and without words. Once I was involved in the work for She Who Is um, and then took the male images of God and they became relativized. They weren't literal. They were pointing. They were analogies pointing to God. Then that opened, and there were all these female ways. Then I went further, and I said, well, there are all these animal ways of talking about God, the eagle, and under your wings we find protection, and, and then the natural with the rock, you know, the light, and so on. And everything about God became bigger and less defined. Um, and so for me, it's mostly being in the presence well, Beth, I want to wish you many more years of being in that presence. And really, uh, I want to say publicly, thank you for all you've done uh, on behalf of myself and behalf of all of your readers and students for all you've done to help us encounter God, encounter she who is. Beth's new book, Creation and the Cross, The Mercy of God for a Planet in Peril, is available now from Orbis Books or wherever books are sold. Today on People of God, we're talking to Maria Luevano Salazar. Maria is a teacher at Cristo Rey Jesuit High School in Chicago, and she recently went to the Holy Land on a pilgrimage with America Media as part of the Ignatian Educators Program. Welcome to Faith and Focus, Maria. Thank you. Thank you so much. And welcome back from the Holy Land. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Can you tell us uh, your overall impressions of just what it was like to be where uh, Jesus walked and, and lived and preached and rose from the dead? Just from the beginning, I, I still remember when you said, close your eyes and listen to the sounds that Jesus listened to. And that just started everything at the right note. I really um, enjoyed the visit to Magdala. That was very powerful to me. What made Magdala so important for you, and what makes Mary Magdalene an important figure for you? Um, so I think there's a lot of conversation of women in the church, um, and, and that spoke to me throughout the whole pilgrimage and to a lot of us women, I would say. Um, and we um, heard a, a great homily um, a few days before where um, Father Matt Malone said uh, Mary was a church for those 20 minutes. It is so that great insight that between the time that... Uh, the risen Christ appeared to her uh, on Easter Sunday and the time she announced the good news to the mm -hmm. disciples. She was the church, basically. A lot of people really respond to that, uh, to that insight uh, of Matt's. Picturing Jesus walking up and being there and such an important female figure um, in our history and, and a true calling for, for us, for women, to, to have that role in the church. Uh, was just powerful. Um, what would you? What did you bring back to your students at Cristo Rey? Have they talked about it a lot with you? Have they asked you questions? Um, so when I had the time, I shared with every single one of my classes, just three, four of the pictures um, that I consider kind of um, enclose the experience, um, and it was just so amazing to see. Like their eyes were like wide open and. And they said, wow, Ms. Levano, you visited the very places that we've heard all this time in the Bible. Um, so, yeah, it was, I think they're still, um, they still ask me questions. They still want to know more. And, I mean, of course, I am still processing a lot of it. But very happy to share all the time and, and just very grateful that I had the opportunity to be there. That's beautiful. Uh, have you had a chance to read the Gospels or hear the Gospels uh, proclaimed at Mass, and has that been different for you uh, since you came back? Yeah, um, listening to the Scriptures, and they mentioned Galilee, and I said, oh my God, I was just there, <laughs> impressed, like, I'm just, 
over the moon. Well, I just want to thank you for sharing your experiences, but also want to thank you for being a great pilgrim uh, with us. The Ignatian Educators Program, through people's generosity, enables uh, people from Jesuit high schools and colleges to join us. And you were such a treasured part of the trip. So thank you for being a great pilgrim, Maria. Thank you so much. If you have a story about how God has touched your life, send it to us at americamag.org slash faithshow. Today on My Life with the Saints, we're looking at St. Joseph, the husband of Mary and the foster father of Jesus. And I'm here with my friend and colleague, Kevin Clark, senior editor of America, author of a great book on Oscar Romero, and himself a father. Welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me, Jim. You know, one of my favorite aspects of St. Joseph is that he shows us the value of the hidden life. Now, the hidden life usually relates to Jesus' time between ages 12 and 30. There's nothing written about that time in the Gospels, but that was surely the time when Joseph was an important figure in Jesus' life, really a crucial figure. Even though Joseph is given no lines to speak in any of the Gospels, and he seems almost ignored by the New Testament, he helped to shape Jesus in his early life. Yeah, I guess I would love to relate more to, uh, to this patron of fathers, uh, to try to find more that I can model from, uh, but there's, there's just not that much in Scripture about St. Joseph. We know he was a hard worker, we know he was an honorable man, and he took care of his family, and those are the things that are expected of us as fathers, but the job, as we learn, requires so much more than that, and uh, we don't hear too much about that uh, in St. Joseph's life. Yeah, that's right, um, but we do know a little bit about his life. We know, thanks to the Gospels, that he was a tecton, or Greek for carpenter. We know that his foster son followed him into his profession. And we know that even though he could have divorced Mary, who was pregnant while they were betrothed, he didn't. And so we know that he was kind or righteous, as the gospel says. Finally, we know that he was attentive to God's word, as when he has a dream telling him to take his family and flee to Egypt. Like the patriarch Joseph in the book of Genesis, who also had dreams with divine messages, Joseph was, you could say, a good listener. Yeah, and I, I think we could probably say he was much better uh, with his toolbox around the house than I have ever been in my home. Um, but I also get the sense somehow in reading about St. Joseph uh, and from the brief references in Scripture that he was a man of great patience, a man of great thoughtfulness, a calming presence in his home. And uh, that's something I'd like to be, frankly, but uh, it's something I also have to struggle with. Well, the saints really do offer us all ways of living. And even though we don't know a whole lot about Joseph, he has helped so many men and women to live holy lives. Thanks so much for sharing your reflections on St. Joseph, Kevin. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Faith and Focus. To support the show and share your faith story, visit americamag.org slash faithshow. We'll have a new episode next month with the best-selling author and poet, Mary Carr. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel so you don't miss it. See you next month on Faith and Focus.